Welcome back to our next unit, new unit, force unit. So we're going to be spending the next few weeks talking about forces. And uh, this is a new slide deck, new unit, new equations, all new stuff, exciting times. All right, let's get started. So Newton has three laws of motion. And um, we're going to spend uh, this first time or this first uh, week talking about the first law of motion. So part one, first law of motion. And um, before we actually get into the first law, I thought it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about who Newton was. So we have two short videos about uh, Newton. Revolutionary English physicist, mathematician, and philosopher Sir Isaac Newton is perhaps the most famous scientist in history. Born to a farmer in 1642, Newton worked his way through school waiting tables and cleaning wealthier students' rooms. He went to university at Cambridge, where he would eventually earn a professorship. During the Great Plague in 1665, Cambridge shut down and Newton returned home. It was during this hiatus that he first conceived the method of infinitesimal calculus, began to theorize the laws of planetary motion, and started his work with light and color. Though his discoveries would change the world of science, he didn't care about the glory and fame that came with them. He wasn't too concerned with publishing and making it available to other people, uh, getting glory for his own sake. It was an intellectual challenge that he wanted to deal with. Every discovery that Newton made had two aspects. First, Newton made the discovery, and second, other people had to discover that he had made the discovery. In 1671, Newton demonstrated his revolutionary reflecting telescope for the Royal Society, and soon after published his notes on color, describing his research on optics. After a visit from Royal Society member Edmund Haley, encouraging Newton to prove Robert Hooke's hypothesis on planetary motion, Newton wrote his Principia, which introduced his three laws of motion and first described the idea of gravity. Newton's Principia is generally reckoned to be the single most important scientific book ever written because for the first time it set forth a working, quantitative, exact, mathematical system based upon experiment and critical observation. His work made him very popular and led Newton to being elected to Parliament. After several years in London, Newton suffered a nervous breakdown. Though he came out of it, his interest in physical science was replaced with philosophy and alchemy, particularly how they both related to a higher power. Alchemy was concerned with manipulating what were seen to be four elemental properties in nature the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and realizing that these things made all substances, that you could therefore not only make any other substance, such as gold, but you could also somehow learn the secrets by which God had put the world together. Newton's later years were spent less in science and more as a public figure. Upon Robert Hooke's death in 1703, Newton became president of the Royal Society, though he didn't get along with many of its members and made many enemies. Newton spent his final years a wealthy and famous mm. man whose discoveries made enormous impact on society. In the century that came after in the 1800s, we find that the fascination with science, with order, and with reasoned knowledge really set the whole tone of that culture. The one single figure from whom they drew most deeply was in fact Isaac Newton. I think a few interesting, thing, interesting things about that. One, um, they shut down Cambridge because of the plague. So, you know, distance learning, at least we had distance learning, right? Pandemic shut down the schools, but at least we were still learning stuff. Uh, in Newton's time, they just shut down the whole school. Um, but I would say Newton is probably, in my opinion, the smartest man to have lived in terms of science. The guy was an absolute genius. And he wasn't in it for fame or fortune or money. Like <clears throat> that one guy was saying, a lot of times he would invent something and nobody would know about it. 
until years later because he just didn't care about publishing anything. He would make these great discoveries and he'd be like, eh, and he would just kind of keep them in his, uh, his notebook. So um, brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, this video is even shorter. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about Newton. Isaac Newton, I mean, just look at, you read his writings. The hair stands up on, I don't have hair there, but if I did, it would stand up on the back of my neck. You read his writings. The man was connected to the universe in ways that I've never seen another human being connected. Kind of spooky, actually. Uh, he discovers the laws of optics, figures out that white light is composed of colors. That's kind of freaky right there. You take your colors of the rainbow, put them back together, you get white light again. That freaked out the artists of the day. <laughs> How does that work? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet gives you white. Uh, the laws of optics, he discovers the laws of motion and the universal law of gravitation. Then a friend of his says, well, why do these orbits of the planets, why are they in the shape of an ellipse with a flattened circle? Why aren't they some other shape? And he said, you know, I can't, I don't know. I'll get back to you. So it goes, goes home, comes back a couple months later. Here, here's why. They're actually conic sections, sections of a cone that you cut. And they said, well, how did you find this out? How did you determine this? Well, I had to invent integral and differential calculus to determine this. Then he turned 26. Then he turned 26. We've got people slogging through calculus in college just to learn what it is that Isaac Newton invented on a dare, practically. So that that's my man, Isaac Newton. So that's right. Calculus was invented to solve physics problems. That is why calculus exists. There are physics problems that cannot be solved using algebra and trigonometry. So Newton came up with calculus in order to solve these physics problems that needed to be solved. Pretty amazing. Okay, so now we know a little bit about Newton. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about him in class. Let's, let's move on to acceleration. You already know all of this stuff, at least you should, because we just took a test on it. Acceleration is a change in velocity. The units are meters per second squared. Acceleration happens when things speed up, slow down, or change direction. Hopefully you didn't get that wrong on the test. Um, acceleration measures how much velocity is changing every second. So this slide I pulled from our old notes. So like I said, uh, hopefully you didn't miss any of those. And um, I just want to kind of refresh what acceleration is. Mass, we haven't talked about mass. Mass has the symbol lowercase m. It is the amount of matter or stuff in an object. Stuff. And uh, the units are kilograms. So we're, we're going to be using kilograms for mass. And mass is a scalar quantity. Mass just has a magnitude. So it's, there's just a size. There is no direction with mass. And the mass of an object does not change unless the object gains or loses stuff. So the only way I can change my mass is if I eat a pizza or I cut my hair. Um, however, if I move into outer space, my mass does not change. I still have the same mass in outer space as on Earth because the mass is the amount of matter. So if I go in outer space, I didn't gain electrons or lose electrons or protons or neutrons. I have the same amount of matter so my mass is the same, okay? So I don't have, I'm weightless in space, but that's weight. So I have zero weight, and we're gonna talk about weight and mass um, soon, probably next week. A force, force is a push or a pull. Uh, the units are kilograms, meters per second squared. However, that is very awkward to write. Uh, so they came up with something, uh, instead of calling everything kilogram meters per second squared, they said, you know what, let's just call it a Newton. So forces are measured in Newtons, and we use capital N. 
So that's what we're going to be using, newtons. And a force is a vector quantity. So a force does have a size, a magnitude, and it has a direction also. So you can push something left or right or up or down. Um, it has a direction or at angles. And we're going to be dealing with all of that soon. Inertia. This you might not know. Inertia is an object's tendency to resist a change in motion. So things are lazy. They want to keep doing what they're doing. That property is known as inertia. So I came up with a one word definition um, because I thought this definition that they gave here is kind of clunky. So my one word definition is stubborn. You also think of it as lazy. So things are stubborn. They don't want to change. They want to resist change. And it corresponds to the mass of an object. So the more mass something has, the more inertia it has. And the less mass, less inertia. All right, here's an example. Which has more inertia and is therefore harder to push? Take a guess, which one do you think is harder to push? Or sorry, which one has more inertia? The answer is the bigger truck. Uh, the bigger truck has more mass. It has more inertia. So that means it's more stubborn. So it doesn't want to change. If it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest and not move. Uh, this has less mass, less inertia. It's easier to move. Um, and I'm not quite sure why this guy doesn't have a shirt on. But anyway, let's do another example. Uh, which has more inertia and is therefore harder to stop? Take a guess. The answer is, of course, the train. Train has more mass. Train has more inertia. If a train is going at five miles an hour and the car was going at five miles an hour and the skateboarder was going at five miles an hour, the skateboarder would be easiest to stop. The train would take a lot longer to stop. Even if it's going five miles an hour, it's harder to stop the train because it has way more mass, way more inertia. It's way more stubborn. So it's in motion. It doesn't want to change. It's stubborn. It wants to stay in motion. It wants to keep moving. And that brings us to our last slide for today. It is Newton's first law of motion. This is also known as the law of inertia. And Newton's first law, AKA the law of inertia, says that an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion unless acted on by a net unbalanced force. So things are stubborn. They wanna keep doing what they're doing unless the only way they're going to change what they're doing is if there's a net unbalanced force. And we're going to talk about what that means soon, but it's basically um, if the total force of something um, exists, if there's a total force pushing left or right, then there's going to be a change in motion. But if there's not a net unbalanced force, if the forces are all balanced and there is zero net force or zero, um, zero unbalanced forces, then the object is going to stay doing what it's doing. So if an object experiences a non, should be a, a non-zero total force, it will accelerate. So if there's zero force, zero total force, it's going to stay doing what it's doing. It'll either stay at rest or stay in motion. But if the total force is non-zero, not zero, it's going to accelerate. And so we're going to be spending uh, this week going into more detail. I'm um, looking forward to seeing you guys in class soon.